please welcome to the stage Dr. Jason Lewis. Uh, good morning. Um, it is, with the first slide up, please. It is my great pleasure today to announce and introduce this year's Roger Chen Award winner. So the, the, the award is named after, of course, the very famous Roger Chen. Roger, um, the award is given to an early stage investigator, or at the time, an assistant associate investigator, who has made a significant contribution to the field of molecular imaging in the area of chemical biology. And of course, Roger Chen won the Nobel Prize for this very area a number of years ago. And Roger sadly passed away a few years ago, but this award really, I think, is a testament to his belief and advances in chemical biology and is given to a recipient that is making the same kind of strides as Roger. This year's winner is Brian Zeglis from Hunter College. Um, I have some notes here, and I have my glasses to read my notes on Brian's educational history. Brian's still laughing, I've got glasses on. Okay, so Brian received his scientific education at Yale University. He actually was a dual major in English and chemistry, so a bit of an overachiever, um, where he worked on organometallic chemistry of carbines with Robert Crabtree. The Caltech, the California Institute of Technology, is where he then did his PhD work with the very well-known and famous Jackie Barton. At that point, he came to actually my lab in MSK and, and worked uh, learning about radiochemistry. So he saw the light and decided that was a good, good area to go into. After that point, he went off and built his own village. And he built his village at Hunter College, building a program of innovation of paradigm-shifting chemical biology of new bioconjugation techniques, training some down the front here, training some of the next generation in a superb manner. And it is profoundly uh, an honor for me to introduce Brian because what he has done, what his lab has done, and what his lab is doing, I think fundamentally changes the way that we do molecular imaging and chemical biology. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Brian, um, the 2022 Roger Chen Award winner. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. So let's see, look at my talk up there. There we go. So um, this is the first time I've talked in front of a live audience in about 30 months, so bear with me as I get my bearings. So, I mean, before I started, I wanted to give my own personal, very brief intersection with Roger Chen. My first year of graduate school, I did not think I was cut out for this. I thought I wasn't smart enough, I wasn't good enough at it, I didn't even like it enough, and there were two talks that really convinced me that, like, inspired me to stay. And that was Carolyn Bertozzi's, who you'll see her work later in this talk, and then Roger Chen. And I was so amazed by what he had been able to do that I thought, okay, maybe I'll give this a try. And one thing led to another, and then I'm here. So the core of the work we do is predicated on the notion of using antibodies for nuclear medicine, essentially to use antibodies to deliver diagnostic and therapeutic radionuclides to target tissues. And in this regard, antibodies are great. They're highly specific, they have high affinity, they're highly stable, but they're not perfect. They can be immunogenic. They only target extracellular targets for the most part. And then two things that we are going to talk about today. First, their construction can be imprecise. And finally, they have slow pharmacokinetics. So in trying to address these issues, we really, my lab, are, we're tool makers. So we are the blacksmith making the tools that later the people that make final products bring out to the market. But when, <clears throat> then when I made this slide, I thought this isn't, this doesn't really do me or the lab justice. So I took a totally real and not fake photo of me working in the lab to um, really make it a little bit better. So let's start with the first topic for today and that's site-specific bioconjugation. Here are the few people that have worked on this over the years, Pierre, Delphine, Brendan, Rosemary, and the only one of these five currently in the group, Cindy. As it so happens, two of these couples ended up getting married. Um, so if the lab's not really good for anything else, at least it's a halfway decent matchmaking service. So if we talk about site-specific bioconjugation, the story starts with the way it's usually done. The overwhelming majority of bioconjugations are done stochastically by reacting NHS esters or isothiocyanates with lysines in an antibody. And this is admittedly really easy, but 
it creates a mitochondria that are poorly defined and heterogeneous on two levels. First, if we take an antibody with 35, 40 lysines, if we get a degree of labeling of three, what we really have is a, is a distribution of degrees of labeling from about zero to six. And then even within a given degree of labeling, we can have anywhere for, let's like, say, a DOL of two, have, can have 780 regioisomers. And this is problematic because each one of those regioisomers can have slightly different chemical, biochemical, physiochemical characteristics that, it, that can affect their in vivo behavior. So how do we fix this? Well, site-specific bioconjugation produces better defined and more homogeneous immunoconjugates. And so th the goal here is to modify just a single site or sites so that we get a single DAR, a single DOL, and a single regioisomer. And there's been a lot of work that's shown that the in vivo behavior of site-specifically modified radiaminoconjugates is better than those that have been randomly labeled. So how do we get this site-specific labeling? Well, the answer, how do we get, the answer is chemical selectivity. There are two ways to do it. We can either build, we can either find and exploit uniquely reactive sites within the immunoglobulin as a whole, or alternatively, we can build them in ourselves artificially. And so if you think about all of the different approaches to this, there's really four common threads going after thiols, peptide tags, unnatural amino acids, or the heavy chain glycans. And so all of these, at least the first three, have their disadvantages. Thiols, those conjugations, especially if you use a malleamide, can be unstable. Peptide tags and unnatural amino acids require you to genetically engineer the immunoglobulin. So we thought that maybe heavy chain glycans was the way to go. So what are the heavy chain glycans? They are these two biantenary sugars that are attached to the CH2 region of the FC domain. And we like them for site-specific bioconjugation for two reasons. First of all, they're sugars, they're saccharides, which makes their chemistry and their manipulation fundamentally different from amino acids. So we can do things to them while leaving the antibody, the, the polypeptide chain alone. Second, they're far away from the CDR domains that are responsible for antigen binding. So in order to modify these selectively, we turn to two different selective chemistries. First, enzymes that can manipulate the glycans. And second, the strain-promoted azide alkyne cycloaddition reaction. There's the call back to Carolyn Bertozzi. So how do we do this? Here's one of the glycans here. So first, we treat it with beta-galactosidase. Beta-galactosidase chews off the last sugar in the chain. And then we use this cool enzyme, a promiscuous galactosyl transferase. And what it does is it incorporates an azide-modified galactose into those sugar chains so that now we have a handle for the strain-promoted azide alkyne re reaction with anything we want, shown here a chelator, that then we can label. And we've done this in a lot of settings. And every time, it produces well-defined, homogeneous immunoconjugates with excellent in vivo behavior. And so we've used zirconium, we've used uh, fluorophores, we've used TCOs for pre-targeting, dendromers, toxins. We've really taken this technology for a ride. But then we began to wonder, okay, so what? Okay, so they're better defined and more homogenous. As chemists, we like this because chemists think, okay, like imagine making a small molecule and being like, well, it could be this, but it could be, also could be this. I mean, it's nice to have one thing. But also, and that might be nice from a regulatory position too, but what does it matter practically? And so what we found is from the very beginning, we found that our site-specifically modified radiaminoconjugates are better in vivo than their randomly labeled cousins. And so is it just that they're more homogenous? That probably has something to do with it, but it could also be something else given our manipulation of the glycans. So the glycans are on the FC region, we said before. And the FC region of the antibody is responsible for the interaction between the antibody and FC receptors. Both that FCRN, the neonatal FC receptor, that's responsible for the recycling of antibodies, and also FC gamma receptors. So FC gamma receptors, which are what we're going to be talking about today, are responsible for antibody-mediated therapeutic responses. So that's good for therapeutic antibodies, but we don't want that quite as much. So there's several of them, I think four or five in total, but only FC gamma R1 binds to monomeric antibodies. 
It's expressed by monocytes and macrophages and tissue resident macrophages and places like the liver and the spleen, places where we see a lot of background uptake of radium conjugates. And importantly for us, the binding is glycosylation dependent. So under normal conditions, the FC region is in an open state, but if you deglycosylate an antibody or you manipulate those glycans in a way, that goes into a closed state which can perturb or abrogate FC gamma R1 binding. So what we did to investigate this, the role of this in our stuff is we made three immunoconjugates. First, pertuzumab, HER2 targeting antibody, labeled randomly with DFO, so intact glycans. Second, we used that approach that we talked about before, where we use beta-galactosidase and that promiscuous galactosyl transferase to modify the ends, the four ends of the glycans. And then we did one more, where we used an enzyme called endoase, endos, to chew off the glycans, and just down to little nubs, and we incorporated azides and chelators on the nubs where there's almost no glycans left. And when we interrogated the interaction of these three with FC gamma R1 by surface plasmon resonance, we saw that the endos, the one with the truncated glycans, had the lowest binding affinity and the shortest interaction half time there in the teal. So does this end up mattering in vivo? So the first thing we did is we investigated this in athymic nude mice with HER2 positive breast cancer xenografts. And we saw that it really didn't matter much here. I mean, the behavior was really good across the board for all of the radioimmunoconjugates, as you'd expect, but there wasn't any differences. And we thought, well, maybe this has to do with the fact that athymic nude mice first have murine FC receptors, and pertuzumab is a human antibody, and also they have endogenous antibodies that might take up these receptors. So we switched to humanized NSG mice. And it, these mice are more immunocompromised, which means they don't have endogenous antibodies, and they have human FC gamma R1 receptors. And here, shown here, we see the differences that we were anticipating, where the the radioimmunoconjugate with truncated glycans has higher uptake in the tumor and lower uptake in the spleen and liver than the other two. And you can really see this here in these, these images where the site-specific guy is labeled right here and the randomly labeled is right here. You see more bone, you see more spleen, you see more liver. So with this, the thing we really wanted to do next was move this to the clinic. And so we were lucky enough to get NIH funding. So we moved this into a clinical trial with Jason that is led by Randy Ye at MSKCC, and this was designed to compare the in vivo performance of a randomly labeled variant on the right-hand side and the site-specifically labeled variant with truncated glycans on the left-hand side in patients with HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer. And so our first patient was really exciting. This is the site-specifically labeled variant. So on days one, three, and six, we see the good uptake in the hepatic lesions there on the right-hand side. And our early comparative data was pretty exciting, too. This is the same patient imaged with the randomly labeled variant on the left and the site-specifically labeled variant on the right. And at least qualitatively, to the eye, it seems to me that we get better lesion uptake. We see more lesions, and we see lower background in the site-specifically labeled radiomenic conjugate. And so unfortunately, we don't have a lot of this data, comparative data, because patient recruitment has been hard, both because of the pandemic People don't want to take a lot of extra trips to a hospital. And the need for two sets of zirconium scans, which take up a lot of time. So we've opened up the trial. We, we've, we've amended the trial to eliminate the comparative imaging and add patients with HER2-positive gastric bladder and gallbladder cancer. And so this is, this is ongoing. We're still collecting patients now. We're about two-thirds of the way through the planned cohort. And things are going very well. This is a patient with uh, HER2-positive bladder cancer in which we see very clearly some subclavial and lymph node metastases that can be see, seen also here in these transverse images. So I, I want to keep moving. And so this is an ongoing. We're still collecting patients here, but hopefully we'll be done with this in the quarter one or quarter two of next year. So let's move on to the other chemical selectivity we've been working on, and that's in vivo pre-targeting here. The main people that we, I wanted to call out here are, again, Pierre, Brendan, and Rosemary, but also Oti Kynan, and Oti is an absolute all-star postdoc in my lab currently. She, she is giving a talk here, 
or a poster here on a zirconium-89 labeled antibody that targets galactin-3 binding protein, if you haven't seen it already. More importantly than that, she's just received a K99R00 award that is in support of her completely innovative and totally amazing research using PET to study the biodistribution and pharmacokinetic behavior of microplastics and nanoplastics. So you can all expect to hear a, a bunch of wonderful stuff from OT in the coming years. So enough of that shameless plug. Uh, so going back to the idea of antibodies in nuclear medicine. So the other problem that we talked about was their slow pharmacokinetics. So antibodies take a long time to get where they're going in the body. I mean, everybody here knows that when you inject an antibody labeled as zirconium or lutetium or actinium, it can take five days, seven days, 10 days to reach its optimal biodistribution in the tumor and clear from the blood. The problem is for a directly radio-labeled antibody, the patient and the patient's healthy tissues are being irradiated all that time and afterwards. And so this can cause high radiation dose rates to healthy tissues. So a problem for the field for quite a long time is this. Can we create a system that has all the targeting advantages and stability advantages of antibodies, but the pharmacokinetics and dosimetry of small molecules? And we're going to hear a lot of, we, we're going to hear a little bit about that from Anna, Anna Wu's work on one way to do that on antibody fragments. But here's another way to do it, pre-targeting. So pre-targeting is founded on a principle that's at the same time pretty simple, but also pretty, pretty radical. Decoupling the antibody and the radionuclide, injecting them separately, inje injecting them sequentially, one in front of the other, and allowing them to combine within the body. And so how does this work? So here's the schematic. So we start with our tumor, and we inject an antibody, but it's not just any antibody. It's an antibody that has some sort of extra complementary functionality shown in this picture by the yellow circle. It travels through the blood and accumulates in the tumor. And then, and only then, when it's out of the blood, you inject a small molecule radio ligand with a complementary functionality shown in the, in the pink circle there. The pink circle and the yellow circle facilitate an in vivo combination, ligation, and then the small molecule, radio ligand, clears, and you end up with a radiolabeled tumor. So what all of you are probably wondering right now is, okay, fine, that makes sense, but what are these circles? So over the years, people have tried different things. There's been streptavidin and biotin, bispecific antibodies and radiolabeled haptins, radiolabeled oligonucleotides, but each of these, and each of these is elegant and effective in its own way, but they also have their drawbacks. So what we thought almost a decade ago is, can we do this with chemistry? We are chemists. Can we use covalent bonds to do this? And so for this, we turn to the inverse electron diels alder reaction. And so this is a reaction. It's an old reaction. It was a reaction that physical inorganic chemists really liked to study 50, 60, 70 years ago. But it was resurrected in the late aughts by a guy named Joe Fox at the University of Delaware as a click chemistry reaction. And here it is right here. It's between 1245 tetrazine and transcyclooctane. And we wanted to use this for pre-targeting because it's fast, it's modular, and most importantly, it's bioorthogonal, meaning that the two components will bind to each other and only each other in the complex biological milieu of the body. So how would pre-targeting with this work? It looks a lot like the other schematic. We start with our tumor cells. We inject a, a antibody labeled a transcyclooctane. It accumulates in the tumor and then clears from the blood. Then we inject a small molecule tetrazine radioligand. It zooms through the blood, undergoes the click ligation at the tumor site, and then clears, leaving you with a radiolabeled tumor tissue. And so the first time we did this, we used SW1222 colorectal cancer xenografts. We took an uh, antibody, the A33 antibody, which targets the uncreatively named A33 antigen that's expressed on colorectal cancer cells. We modified it with transcyclooctane. We injected it into the mouse and waited 24 hours for it to accumulate at the tumor and clear from the blood. Then we injected this guy, a tetrazine radioligand that uses a sarcophagian chelator to coordinate copper 64. And what we saw was really exciting. At early time points, four hours post-injection, 
we saw the uptake in the tumor, and that increased a little bit over the course of the over the course of the experiment to 24 hours, and we saw a really great delineation of the tumor tissue. So then we thought we might be stacking the deck in our favor too much with only a 24-hour interval between the two injections. So we lengthened that interval to 48 hours to 120 hours, and the system just kept working. And this was really exciting. And so the next couple years were spent really taking this technology for a ride. Jake Houghton worked on using this technology in pancreatic cancer with the 5B1 antibody that targets the CA199 antigen, which is a slowly internalizing antigen. JP Meyer studied radio ligand optimization and F18 chemistry in the context of pre-targeting. And Pierre Adamo in my lab did, did multimodal imaging with an antibody that was labeled with both a near-infrared fluorophore and a transcycloactine. But really where I thought the most exciting, or at least the most exciting recent advances have come, are in pre-targeted radiomunotherapy, in which the schematic is the same, but at the end we don't take an image, we just allow the radiomunoconjugate to irradiate the tumor therapeutically. So here the earliest work was done with, by Jake Houghton and Rosemary Membrano. Jake Houghton used 5B1 transcycloactine and a lutetium-labeled tetrazine in PDAC xenografts. Rosemary Membrano used an A33 transcycloactine and the same lutetium tetrazine in colorectal cancer xenografts, and both saw really excellent therapeutic efficiency, effectiveness, and dose-dependent response. We saw really nice Kaplan-Meier curves, especially in Rosemary's experiment. The groups that had only received half of the therapy had median overall survivals of about 20 days, 20 to 30 days, Whereas in that experiment, every single animal in each of the experimental cohorts survived for the whole 10 half-lives. More recently, Sophie Pody has done some really fascinating work with actinium-labeled pre-targeted radiomunotherapy. Here she used the 5B1 TCO coupled with an actinium-225 uh, tetrazine. What she saw is that we get on the right-hand side here in the tumor, we saw equal uptake of the radioactivity for pre-targeting in red compared to the directly radiolabeled antibody in blue, but we saw dramatically reduced uptake in healthy tissues like the blood, liver, spleen, kidney, and bone. And when translated dosimetrically, we saw that this gives, us, this gives pre-targeting a higher radiation dose rate to the tumor, but also better therapeutic indices, which suggests this really could improve things clinically. Even more recently than that, O.T. Kynanen has tried to take this in a theranostic direction. So here, the schematic's a little, a little more complicated. Here, we inject the antibody transcycloactine. We allow it to accumulate at the tumor and clear from the blood. Then we inject a radio-labeled tetrazine for imaging. We take some images, but then, rather than be done at that point, OT injects another tetrazine that's labeled with a therapeutic radionuclide. And we can do this because there's so much transcycloactine on the antibody at the tumor that injecting a second one works just as well as injecting just one. So for these experiments, we use isotopologous pairs of a tetrazine sarcophagine radioligand labeled with copper-64 for PET and copper-67, a beta emitter, for therapy. So when we did just the therapy, so just immunoconjugate and copper 67, we saw that the two saline only, or the two halves of the therapy, produced median overall survivals of 21, 21, and 32 days. But then when we started to do the pre-targeted radiomunotherapy, we saw this dose-dependent response going from 70 to, to uh, sorry, 70 days, 100 days, and then over 200 days with 18 and a half, 37 and 55 and a half megabecquerels of therapy. But the real exciting results came with the Theranostics, I think. So here, again, we inject the, the immunoconjugate with TCO. We wait three days. Then we inject the copper 64 labeled tetrazine, take some PET images, and then we inject the copper 67 labeled tetrazine. And so this produced the images that we thought we would get, which were exciting. But what it really showed us is that if we took the PET images and we calculated the cumulated activity in the tumor, this could predict the response to therapy. So there were 10 mice in this cohort. The, three, the only mice that ended up having to be euthanized were the three mice with the lowest cumulated dose in the tumor. 
three, four, and five and a half kilobecquerels. All of the mice above that threshold, six, nine, 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 11, 12, 13 kilobecquerels, all of the mice that we saw got the good uptake of the copper 64 tetrazine went on to respond well to the therapy. And so you can imagine this applied in the clinic in this kind of schema with a go, go or no go decision after the pre-targeted PET imaging. So we've really done a lot of the stuff that we can do in mice with this. So we've been wanting to go to the clinic for quite a long time. And as we applied for grants to get funding to take this into the clinic, we kept getting responses that were something along these lines. Okay, fine, Jason and Brian, this works great in mice with a two milliliter blood volume. What about in people that have a lot more blood? And so to show this, we thought, well, we can use a large animal model, but that's hard to do with tumors and stuff like that. So we turned to the work of innovative work of John Valiant, who a few years ago, 2016, developed a bisphosphonate labeled transcyclooctane. And this targets bone tissue, of course, specifically areas that are undergoing active bone remodeling. And so we coupled this with copper 64 TZ sarcophagene, and we called up the good folks at the University of Missouri who simultaneously have excellent radiochemistry in Heather Hankins and her crew, and also a very active veterinary radiology department led by Jeff Bryan. And so we studied this in dogs with osteosarcoma. And so what we see here is a 70 kilogram, completely human-sized Great Dane with an osteosarcoma lesion in its left forelimb. And we injected it with the bisphosphonate transcyclooctane. We waited six hours. Then we injected the copper 64 tetrazine, waited six more hours, and took a pet image. And what we, we saw three important messages. First, we saw uptake throughout the skeleton, which is what we'd expect with, the with a bisphosphonate. Second, we saw extra high uptake in the osteosarcoma lesion, which is expected because of the active remodeling of the bone there. And finally, we saw very low up background uptake in healthy tissues, only the excretory organs of the kidneys and bladder. So what this really tells us the end, in the end, going even beyond um, the implications for osteosarcoma, is that this in vivo click chemistry works in large animal models. And therefore, by extrapolation, we really think it will work in humans. So I think that's about all I have time for, the clock is telling me. So for conclusions with the site-specific radio labeling, I hope I've shown you that we've created this really exciting way of site-specifically modifying radiomita conjugates, and we're currently validating that in the clinic. For in vivo pre-targeting, We've, I think, I hope I've shown you that it's a really effective way to get a lot of radioactivity to the tumor while reducing radiation dose rates to healthy tissues. We've really validated it out the wazoo with three different antibody antigen systems, um, one bone targeting system, six different radionuclides now, maybe even seven or eight, and two different species. And finally, and I've been saying this for years because it's been slow, but we're really close to finally getting this in the clinic at MSKCC. So with that, I'd like to give a few acknowledgments before we stop. Um, the Lewis Laboratory at MSKCC, specifically Jake Houghton, who is currently doing some really exciting work at Stony Brook, specifically on host guest based uh, pre-targeting. Sophie Pody, who's studying Auger electrons and, and working on those in France. JP Meyer, Sai Sharma, who was a postdoc for both Jason and me and was it's just a wonderful scientific brain to have available. Um, Serge Lyashenko and Randy Ye for their work getting this stuff from the laboratory to the clinic. Brian Agnew at Thermo Fisher Scientific who got us started on the site-specific bioconjugation. All the folks at the University of Missouri and McMaster for the dog study and the NIH, NIH for a few bucks every here and there. Uh, here's my lab. They're just wonderful people to work with. It's really a pleasure and an honor to try to teach them about science. Oh, that's somebody telling me to stop. Um, uh, they are led ostensibly by me, but really by OT. She is the, she is the in-lab leader that really keeps everybody on the up and up. Not that they need being kept in the up and up. Um, but two other special thanks. First to Jason. Jason has really uh, quite literally taught me everything I know about radiochemistry and molecular imaging and really being kind of an adult scientist. Um, he and he, I can't, really honestly cannot imagine a better friend, collaborator, and mentor. Second, uh, former Roger Chen Award winner and current sea captain Tom Reiner, 
who uh, here we are on the left, he's trying to not keep the boat from capsizing. On the right-hand side, it's a moment of calm. That was us in the, in the Hebridean Sea this past June. Uh, and then finally, the most important folks, uh, my wife Emily, who keeps the whole family just together in our heads, keeps us grounded. Our dog, Wembley, Wembley, there he is. He thinks he's tethered to something. It's really just a dish soap bottle. He's dumb, but cute. Uh, and then my sons, Elliot, Calvin, he has a wonderful smile too, but he's just filthy in that picture, so I like it. And then the newest addition are one month old, Wesley. So with that, thank you very much. I, I'm really honored for the award. When I look at the past recipients, I really have this, like, I don't belong here feeling, but um, I really appreciate it. Thank you all for listening and coming out at 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning to listen to me, listen to this spiel, and I'll do my darndest to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. Uh, that was terrific. Thank you very much, Brian. Brian was bragging he had eight hours of sleep last night. So, uh, with a month, <laughs> with a month, one month old, I think it's surprised in itself. I remember those. But days. my wife's watching, so don't tell her. <laughs> oh, Emily's watching. I think so. Hi, Emily. Hi, boys. <laughs> there. Um, we don't have time for questions, but I know Brian's going to be here all day. But his flight is back at six a.m. tomorrow morning, so he'll be at the gala this evening. So please feel free to answer any questions. And we have a plaque for you, Brian. Oh, a plaque. Think. Oh, this is even better than I thought. Lisa, somebody's taking a photo. All right. Lisa there. It's the photo guy. Hang on. Julie, somebody can somebody run up with an iPhone because I can't and see Joni, the photographer Joni's, or Lisa. Cindy and Joni's guy. Oh, there we go. All right. All right. We're Thank posed. you. Some photo. <laughs> Thank you. Look Thank you very that. much. And I believe now we have Ralph Bernardinus and the plenary. So um, don't go anywhere. Thank you very much indeed.